Ab and Celia were married in 1926, and it's clear from the pictures that it was when they got married that he started to doodle on his wage packets. Give her a wage packet, little drawing, there you are, I love you, here's your money for the week. There's one where he's drawn pots, pans, and a broom. And I thought, well, maybe this is him saying to her, just here's your money for the housekeeping. And I think it kind of got into his brain, I'm going to give her a message every week. It's like a love note. Rituals part of their lives are quite religious. So I think he just established a new ritual. And as time went on, the doodles got more and more elaborate. I bet he enjoyed her responses to it. And of course, except a couple of those early ones that just have hearts on them. Every picture has her on it. And those beginning pictures are really flirtatious. They're like little love letters. They're very private, very intimate. And he obviously loved her legs. You know, there's a lot of beautiful drawings of her legs. You know, he worshipped her legs. One thing that people will pick up is that he always draws her with a red nose. The story is, of course, that she had a cold on the day that she was married and her, her nose came up all bulbous and red. And uh, so she went under the chuppah, you know, which is a, the Jewish wedding, but miserable because she had this terrible cold and this red nose. And I think this is a loving gesture. I think Ab's gone, I want to preserve you like you were the day when my princess became my queen, you know, on that really special day, because I think it was the most important day of their lives when they found their soulmates. If you calculate the weeks and you work out that they were married between 1926 and 1982, 55 and a half years, there's about 3,000 of them. If you do the maths, they're pretty much all there. That's one a week. Every picture related to something that happened in the week. So something in the week inspired him and then he gave her a gift of art every week. But then of course, as time went on, something that happens in the week may not be romantic. There's one where Celie's on her way to a divorce court and she's got an L plate for like a learner driver. And I've no idea what the story was behind that, but there's something about the picture you think, yeah, there's a bit of irony, a bit of humor there. But behind that, were they having a row? One of my favorite pictures you'll see is just them sitting either side of a wall. We can only speculate as to what that was, but it's this huge image of they can't communicate. Beautiful way that he draws their postures so that they're giving each other this slight cold shoulder. They're wanting to communicate across this gap and they can't. By the 1930s, he's definitely feeling that he has to tell the truth of maybe the most important thing that happens in the week. So that the whole collection, all the way through until the early 1980s, it's a chronicle, really. You could see the whole sweep of their married life, all the ups and downs through it in this one once a week ritual. I think he didn't shy away at all from telling the truth about anything. That's why I think he's a great artist, because he was honest. Jeff was born in 1928, and you can see from the pictures the huge joy and fun they had with the first son. The Yiddish word is kvelling. You know, you swell with pride at the achievements of your children. The Jewish joke that sums up Kvelling the best for me is, you know, what's the definition of a genius? It's an ordinary child with Jewish grandparents. They can do nothing wrong. And you kind of get that feeling when Jeff was born that there was huge pride. You see him being weighed on the scales. Those moments of babyhood, which nowadays will Facebook and tweet pictures of the newborn baby's first steps. Ab recorded those with Jeff. There are other areas which are absent that we know is true. Jeff was a gay man. He wasn't, as far as I know, explicitly out to his parents, but it was very hard to avoid the fact he didn't have any marriage and he was explicitly out to my grandmother, his auntie. Obviously, through a lot of Jeff's life, being gay was illegal. So I've, I've no doubt that Celia and Ab would have known that he was gay, um, but it's never mentioned at all in Ab's art. Larry is born in 1934, so it wasn't a diagnosis of autism in those days, but now we would have recognised him as being autistic. And he uh, experienced big epileptic seizures as well, which I think were really difficult to manage. And he used to like to sing loudly and proudly at the top of his voice all the time, out of context. All those Disney songs that were very popular during that time. One of the pictures you've got Celie teaching all her three boys, including Ab, Give a little whistle from Pinocchio. And if you start to slide, give a little whistle. 1950 comes, and it's clear that they can't manage his care anymore. Celie was, you know, a little sparrow of a woman, and he was a strapping guy. You can see from the images on the wage packets, he's starting to get towards six foot. 
I think it was an extraordinarily difficult decision to make. And he went to live in a place called Knapsbury Hospital. And it is a, it's known as a mental asylum. Of course, people would have called it a loony bin. And having a learning disability or autism or any other kind of physical disability like cerebral palsy or whatever, you are considered to be, you know, you can go in one of the loony bins. And that's what happened to Larry. And Celia and Ab would have seen him once a week on a Sunday. And Ab depicts it. So at one point, you see Larry talking to Celia and Ab and saying, it's all right, you can go home now. And just by the posture in their bodies, you know that they feel ashamed. Ab records it again, and he records Larry's death as well. And, and Larry died in 1978. And there's a picture that Ab draws of the week that Larry died with Celia and Ab, with their backs to us, as it were, looking at the bed where presumably Larry's body is, but all you can see is this kind of yellow halo. It's very subtle. And then Ab draws these pictures during the war, and they're funny. And I think that's what he does. But it, beneath all the humour, there is some seriousness, because there you can see in the windows these bombs raining down on London. And there he shows Celie in a tin hat in the bed, saying, I'm feeling this more than you because I'm near the window. And you know the house would have been shaking and they would have been terrified and separated from their sons who were evacuated, including their disabled son. And I think in a way he was giving messages to Celie during the war to kind of keep her spirits up, but also depicting her as resilient. There's one in which he refers to her as Mrs. Miniver. That was a film of the time about a resilient middle-class woman during the war whose family are dying and she has to cope with it. So he depicts her in these different archetypes all through the years. But it's, of course, it's a huge act of love, isn't it? And I think he was incredibly aware of that sense of living for the moment because you don't know what's around the corner. And living for the moment meant I'm going to make this beautiful piece of art for my wife and I love her and I'm going to draw the humour out of every situation. You know, when those bombs are raining down in London, you don't know the next one's not going to hit your house. So we'll make a joke about that and we'll make light of it and live for the moment because it's a way of relieving anxiety. You can see there's a moment where he suddenly goes into colour, which I think is when he retired, about that time, 1960. And that's when they made this great move out of the East End to Golders Green, to the Promised Land, where the rest of the community had gone years before, but they'd stuck in Hackney. My guess is he had more time on his hands, he'd retired. And what's interesting, you look at the wage packets, that they're kind of sealed wage packets. Obviously, before he retired, they were opened up and the money was taken out of them. I'm sure what he did was he went, I have to do this. I, you know, I'm, I'm committed to this project. I'm not going to stop doing it. So what does he do? He goes to stationers and he buys blank wage packets. They're blank canvases for him, aren't they? So he kept up the ritual and then he fills up the whole of the canvas with colour. I had no idea I was going to be in the pictures at all when I started looking through them. And suddenly I found a picture that was Celia and Ab holding a baby and the caption says to Mrs. Solomons, a grandson at half price. Now, of course, they didn't have grandchildren because Jeff as an unmarried gay man in those days was unlikely to have kids. Larry is institutionalized. He's not going to have kids. So my grandma Lily was so close to them and so they borrowed her grandchildren. And that was just a kind of delight to find that. And then later there's one where I'm begging him to show me an envelope. And I can't remember this at all and I can never remember seeing one. So my guess is on that day, I was asking him to see an envelope, but he wouldn't show it to me. So I'm guessing that was a dirty picture. Celie had much more aspiration all through their lives than Ab did. She was the one in all the pictures who's looking in windows at fur coats. There's a lot of jokes about getting her a fur coat and about how terribly he dresses. There's probably hundreds of pictures her complaining that he's a schlump, which is the Yiddish word for a guy who just can't wear a suit properly, is just a mess, a scruff. She's always adjusting his tie, she's always going to a clothes shop to try and find something to fit him when it won't, you know. He never looks the part, and that's what he does, is his kind of joke, whereas she looks gorgeous and elegant, and here she is with this schlump on her arm, and that's a joke that goes on through the, the art, from the earliest, earliest ones, all the way through 55 years. He never managed to dress himself properly. One of the funniest for me, he dresses himself up in a kilt 
Now, I don't imagine he really was wearing a kilt. Uh, and he puts in a kind of cod Scottish accent. I'm trying to do to match my wee lassie. And she's wearing some kind of tartan blouse. So you can imagine, you know, maybe she's gone up to the West End and bought a tartan blouse. And there's been a big deal about it. So he's put himself in the Solomon's tartan. And then he's put this little phrase at the bottom, the clan McShmo. It's a schmo, he's a schmuck, he's, he's a fool, he's an idiot. So it's almost as if he's saying, isn't he? It's in the DNA. I'm from the clan McSchmo, you're not going to change me anyway, you know. I'm just a schmo. I think what was really clear is they were hot for each other. There's a lot and lot of images of them in bed together. And in one way or another, sex is being talked about quite explicitly. In the early days there's a picture of her pulling the sheets off him saying come on like she hasn't had enough and she wants more and there are saucy things with the tropes of a seaside postcard every so often with him looking up her skirt and those, those kinds of things there's an image where he's in the bath he's wearing a bath towel it's during the war and there's a tiny little shallow amount of water in the bath she's holding a ruler looking quite severe and he's saying i'm sure it's only four and three quarter inches on one level, that's about water rationing, isn't it? You know, because you're only allowed five inches of water once a week. But of course, you know, this might well be a knob joke. Now, I knew these people when they were old people. So the last thing I would imagine was them young and hot for each other. But I think they had a good sex life and it's talked about a lot. Sometimes teasing because there's a trope that she doesn't want it and he's gagging for it and all the rest of it right the way through. But I think part of that was that he did find her incredibly sexy and fancied her. I think he fancied her all the way through. One of the things you notice, he likes drawing the same thing over and over and over again as an artist. Sometimes their kitchen, for example, but, but one of the rooms that gets drawn all the way through from the 20s through to the 80s is their bedroom. You know, this is the stage on which the drama is played out. And one of the moments that just made me chuckle was coming across a picture called The Cleavage. And suddenly, instead of one double bed, there are two single beds. Sometimes it's the couple's might do the thing of the snoring is so bad or the, or the habits are so bad that there's that maybe you go off to the spare room or whatever because I can't get proper sleep. But I think in that generation there was a ritual. I think there was a moment where the double bed was taken out and twin beds were put in. It was a cultural thing of that generation. There's a little bit of, of joking going on after the cleavage about, you know, will you hop onto my bed for a cuddle? You know, all that kind of stuff is going on when they're after the cleavage. So there's some kind of joking still around bedroom antics going on even then. There are pictures of Celie going into hospital. We know she had cancer. She goes into hospital one week and the next week he draws himself graffitiing the hospital wall saying, come home Celie and he'd only been apart from her a week, and we know they'd been married 40 years at that point, but he's just saying, isn't he? He's saying, I miss you like crazy. I've not been with you for a whole week. She doesn't seem to age at all in the Right towards the end of her life, he draws her in the bath like she's Cleopatra. A lot of the time when I was alive, when I remember her, she was very ill. She had tongue cancer. She lost the use of her voice, so she found it difficult to speak. She was quite frail and very thin, but he doesn't draw her like that at all. She's still the woman that he married. They're humorous, but they're not light-hearted in a way. There's one where the doctors are saying, we can loosen your tongue a little so you can talk more. And Ab is behind a door listening in, and he's going, more? As if to say, you know, how could she possibly talk any more than she already does? But when you know she had tongue cancer, you realize that there's bitterness and sweetness together. The loneliness he feels in those evenings where your loved one that you've shared that bed with for all those years is suddenly not there in the morning. And of course, there's no depiction of how he felt when she did die, because the drawings stop. There's no muse anymore. They delight everybody who sees them. I've yet to meet someone who goes, ah, couldn't care less about, you know, they're fascinating. Because he wasn't doing it for a market. This is not marketized, this is not commoditized art. That's what I adore about it. And that's the irony, isn't it? Because it's private, it's got a, a truthfulness behind it. I think the funny ones, I think she loved them and she would have laughed at them and enjoyed them and felt the warmth and the love coming from them. The ones that, that puzzle me more are where they're much more serious, where they talk about something like Larry's death, 
or where there's obviously a conflict in their own relationship, whether she would have melted when she saw him joke about that. There are two schools of thought here. One school of thought is that he drew the pictures instead of talking to her, that men of that generation are emotionally not massively literate and therefore it's easier to say something through his art. The other school of thought is it actually facilitated better conversation because once you've made that, then there's something to talk about, that the agenda is set and the issue is out there. And we will never know that. Maybe people can look around the exhibition and look at the pictures and speculate for themselves. That community would have had, if not arranged marriages, semi-arranged, you know, they had to marry somebody who was from that community. They had no choice to marry out and some of the marriages were literally arranged and she was the girl who lived across the street in Dalston. And from that, there were childhood sweethearts all the way through.